Welcome to Blue Crane Digital's introduction to the Canon Digital Rebel XT training DVD. Since its release, the Digital Rebel XT has been embraced by thousands of photographers. Why would someone consider buying this camera? The answer is simple, to take better pictures. But remember, this is just a tool. It may have great optics, it may store a large amount of data, but the quality of the image is really determined by the operator, you. We're going to simplify this seemingly complex piece of equipment and give you the freedom to take the types of pictures you want. This video is not designed to replace your camera manual. It's designed to focus on the most important features and controls of the camera. Camera manuals have never been designed to teach you how to shoot great photos. They have been constructed like a technical manual, describing how each component works. They are not intended to show you what the engineers had in mind when they finalized the layout of the buttons, or decided how things should work together. Compare the manual to the owner's guide in the glove box of your car. You wouldn't dream of teaching yourself to drive just by reading it, would you? Well, think of this presentation as a mini driver's education class for your camera. We've broken this video down into small, easy to understand sections. First, we'll demystify the camera and the photo taking process. We'll cover topics that define the quality of your pictures. Following camera operation, we'll discuss composition and why it's important. Then, we'll look at more advanced topics before tackling the process of getting the photos from the camera to your computer. Last but not least, we'll talk about color correction, cropping, and printing. We'll cover the software that came bundled with your camera, and present a section on Photoshop Elements version 3. Don't worry if you don't grasp the advanced features the first time you watch this presentation. Use your new Digital Rebel XT for a few weeks, and these topics will make a lot more sense. Before we start, here's a tip that can make learning this camera easier. Your camera comes with a manual. It can be carried in your bag, but the print is small, and finding specific topics can be difficult. For me, the manual is more useful if it's larger and easier to read. The manual can be downloaded from the Canon website in PDF format. Canon has posted this material in several places. Since the file is PDF format, you'll need Adobe Reader to open it. Next, select the File, Print option from your browser. In the Printer dialog box, select Fit to Paper. This will allow you to print a larger copy of this manual. You can either print the manual single-sided or double-sided, as I've shown here. I've placed the printed manual in a three-ring binder. The larger format is much easier to use. So let's get started. In about 90 minutes, you'll have the skills to take better pictures. The key to understanding this camera is to break it down into simple sections. New users of the Digital Rebel XT are often overwhelmed by all the choices that are available, especially in this LCD monitor. Using custom functions allows you to configure the camera in millions of ways. Here is the first thing you need to know. Most of the time you will never have to look at the LCD monitor to get great pictures. Many of these controls are for fine tuning or setting personal preferences. Once you master a few concepts and controls, all these settings will make logical sense. We'll cover them in the advanced section of this presentation. Now, we'll spend some time looking at the controls on the outside of the camera and giving you a structure for using the XT. Setting up a shot is controlled with these buttons and dials. Since you know you'll rarely have to access the back monitor, this camera is already easier to understand. We'll start with some fundamentals. By the end of this presentation, you'll intuitively know where everything is located. When you take pictures with your point-and-shoot camera, you don't really think about it very much. The engineers who designed it wanted you to turn it on and let the camera make all the decisions. But professional photographers know that getting great shots requires being involved in the process. It doesn't have to be complicated, but being engaged makes all the difference. Think about taking pictures in three steps. Step one, configure the settings that always remain the same. These are things like the date and time or storing your personal preferences, like image format and size. They are located on the LCD monitor under the setup, playback and shooting menus. 
you'll probably configure this information once and sell them or never change it. Just double check it before you leave the house. Second, you are at the spot where you want to take pictures. A party, a garden, the beach. You look at the lighting conditions. Are you inside or outside? Is the light bright or dim? You might adjust the white balance and ISO settings. These settings are displayed on this LCD monitor. We'll cover all of them later. Third, you're ready to take the picture. You look through the viewfinder and see the settings that will affect the captured image. These include focus, shutter speed, and aperture. These settings are controlled with this arrow pad on the back of the camera, this AF point button, and this main dial on the front. Why is it important to have this structure? Once you're ready to shoot a picture, you won't be looking all over the camera to find the right control. You're already engaged in the process and you know the correct control is right at your fingertips. Using this three-step approach makes this camera easier to use. Let's look at the controls that matter. We'll start here. This mode setting knob is where you turn your camera on full automatic control and forget it. A generation of film photographers never changed this setting, but we're going to. First, we'll divide the shooting modes into logical groups, so they make more sense. When you set the camera on full automatic, it does four things for you. It focuses the lens, then it meters the amount of light and the distance to your subject. It sets the aperture, or size of the lens opening. Then it sets the shutter speed. You snap the picture, you get an average exposure. Canon has decided to expand on this theme with the settings on this side of the dial. These modes also fully control the camera, each designed for specific conditions. For the landscape setting, the camera is preset with a small aperture to help keep everything in focus, while the shutter speed is set fast enough to eliminate a blurred image. You can also use this setting for night landscapes. Later, we'll cover customizing the camera to get better low light photos. For the sports setting, a faster shutter speed is locked in to freeze the subject and background. The camera uses the center of the viewfinder for focusing. For portraits, the aperture is open for a shorter depth of field. This keeps the person in focus, but blurs the background for a more pleasing composition. For night portraits, the flash mechanism fires to fill the background and correctly illuminate the subject. The flash offsetting is just like full automatic except it ensures the flash will not fire, even in low light situations. The close-up setting assumes that you'll be taking pictures of plants or insects. Just think of these settings as flavors of fully automatic. You'll get slightly less average pictures, but still average. Canon has done a great job of giving you settings that will usually be close to what you want. You can use these settings anytime to get clear photographs but you can take more control of the camera and produce extraordinary images with the other side of the dial, which Canon calls the creative zone. The camera will still compensate to give you great exposures, but you get even better pictures by making choices that change the qualities of the final photo. Canon uses a very consistent approach to changing settings. First, you press a button, then you turn a dial. Once you understand this, setting up to shoot a picture becomes much more intuitive. As we walk through the rest of this section, you'll see us first press a button and then turn this main dial, located just above the shutter release. Canon has done a great job trying to anticipate what you want in its basic zone settings. However, you may run into problems if you don't understand how the camera picks its focus point. For now, turn the mode dial on your camera to full auto. On the LCD panel, you'll see just a few display icons. Most of the buttons on the back of the camera aren't functional. This is because the camera is determining an exposure and setting all the controls based on whatever is in frame when you focus. The camera will pick the object it thinks is most important for its focus point. As you look through the lens and press the shutter release halfway down, notice that one or several of the seven boxes in the viewfinder turn red. This indicates where the camera has decided to focus the lens. For many situations, this may be okay, but if the camera picks the wrong subject, the resulting photo may be out of focus. Next, turn the mode dial to P. P stands for Program Auto Exposure. It works in a similar way to Full Automatic, but gives you more control. Now, press the AF point button and look at the LCD panel. 
you will notice several dashes on the display. The camera will now focus on the object behind one of the seven AF points. Look through the viewfinder and use the main dial to select an AF point. As you focus by pressing halfway down on the shutter release, the selected AF point will be highlighted and the lens will focus on that area of the frame. Just taking control of this one function and deciding where you want the camera to focus will result in consistently better photographs. We'll come back to the subject of focus in the advanced section. There, we'll cover the use of focus with other features in the camera. All the exposure modes we'll cover for the remainder of this video, with the exception of auto depth of field, allow you to set the AF points. Turn the mode dial back to any of the basic zone settings, and the camera will choose the focal point for the picture. One last point, press the AF point button, and you can also select a point with the arrow pad on the back. Pause the video now and experiment with changing the AF points with your main dial and with the arrow pad. Start the DVD when you're ready to continue. Before we learn how to change settings, we need to know how to reset the camera to the default settings. It's frustrating when you're ready to shoot and you discover the camera settings are incorrect. This is likely to happen if you share your Digital Rebel XT with someone. Reset the camera and you always have a consistent starting point. To reset the camera's outside controls and buttons, access the Setup 2 menu on the LCD monitor. Notice the universal symbol on the top of the monitor for setup. You can toggle between the menus by pressing the Jump button next to the LCD monitor. Select Clear Settings and press the Set key in the center of the main dial. Next, move the selection to Clear All Camera Settings and press the Set key one more time. The camera is now restored to the factory defaults. Just remember, the custom function menu settings will not be reset. The option to reset the custom functions is right below the clear all camera settings. One last tip. Press the info button on the back of the camera when you're not displaying images. You will see many of the important settings of the camera like bracketing, white balance, flash compensation, and ISO. By the end of this presentation, all this information will make sense and you'll be glad that you have this display. Now, let's look closely at the display inside the viewfinder. Remember, these are the settings that control the qualities of an individual shot. Turn the mode dial to P, or Program Mode. Look through the viewfinder and press the shutter release halfway down to focus. The first display you'll notice contains the seven AF points that are superimposed over the viewfinder. As we've previously seen, the red AF points indicate where the lens is focused. You'll see new displays at the bottom of the viewfinder which are not visible when the camera was in full automatic. On the left, we see the shutter setting. Here, the shutter will open and close in 1 60th of a second. Refer to your manual for a good explanation of how partial and full seconds are displayed. Just to the right is the aperture setting. This indicates the size of the aperture opening. A smaller number indicates an open aperture. A larger number indicates the aperture is more closed. We'll cover this in more detail later. Next to the aperture setting is the exposure meter. If the small indicator below the meter is centered under the zero, the camera can take a properly exposed photo with the current settings. If the indicator appears to the right, it indicates an overexposed setting. To the left, the picture will be underexposed. You don't have to worry about this yet, I just wanted to introduce it to you now. The number just to the right indicates how many photos can be taken in burst mode. We'll cover the setting for single frame versus continuous shooting later. One caveat, however, the display only has room for one digit. If you see the number 9, you may be able to shoot many more shots in succession. Last, we see the focus indicator. If the indicator blinks or is not illuminated when the shutter is depressed halfway, it indicates a problem with focusing. This is usually caused by low light situations or an object that is too close to the lens. It will also not illuminate if the camera is in autofocus AI servo mode, covered later in this presentation. This is a lot of information. Happily, the Digital Rebel XT does a great job of keeping the exposure perfectly balanced in most of the creative zone modes. Don't worry about understanding the shutter speed or aperture size yet. 
We'll cover it all very soon. Let's look at this setting first. It's labeled TV. It stands for time value. Some cameras refer to this setting as shutter priority. Remember how full automatic control meters the available light and automatically selects the shutter and aperture? This setting is just one step away. The camera still meters the light. You decide how long the shutter stays open and the camera picks the correct aperture for a properly exposed photograph. If the shutter time is short, the aperture is more open to let in more light. A longer shutter makes the camera close down the aperture, letting in less light for a longer period. Whatever you pick, the camera will compensate. In this setting, the main dial controls the shutter. Hold the shutter button halfway down to focus, then move the dial to the left or right to get the desired shutter speed. Continue to move the main dial to the left or right and the aperture value will begin to blink. This indicates that the shutter time is either too short or too long for a properly exposed picture. Turn the main dial in the opposite direction and the aperture value does not blink. Now, the camera can take a properly exposed photo. Spend a couple of minutes adjusting the shutter. Pause this video and come back after you've checked it out. What would we use shutter priority for? Here's one example. This photo was taken with a short shutter speed. The water is frozen in time. By making the shutter stay open longer, the quality of the water changes. In this photo, the water looks entirely different. With the shutter priority setting, you can decide what you want your image to communicate. Why else would you use shutter priority? Shooting sporting events where fast shutter speeds are critical is a common reason. But wait, doesn't the camera have a sports setting? Well, yes it does, but remember, the camera doesn't know the situation. These happy guys may not require the same fast shutter as a race car. Rather than use an average setting and risk an average picture, you can take control of your images. The amount of light entering the camera is controlled by the aperture. It's like the pupil of your eye. In low light, your pupil gets larger, so you can take in more light. In the Digital Rebel XT's viewfinder, the aperture is displayed as the number just to the right of the shutter speed. The smaller the number, the larger the aperture. So f4 is a larger opening than f11, which is a larger opening than f22. One of the main contributors to controlling the depth of field in a photograph is the size of the aperture when the photograph is taken. I want you to do a little experiment. You can stop this presentation and come back to it after you're done. It is the one thing that will really help you understand the importance of depth of field. First, go to a table in your house. Set a small object, like a salt shaker, on the front edge. Next, place another object, like a pepper mill, in the middle of the table. Finally, place a third object on the back edge. Make sure all three line up in a row, like we're showing here. Now, get your face down at the tabletop level and concentrate your vision on that pepper mill. Look at the details in the mill itself. Once you are focused on the pepper mill, the other two objects will still be in view. Don't focus on them. Focus on the pepper mill. Do you perceive the other objects to be blurry or slightly out of focus? Yes. This is the way our eyes see and our mind perceives the world. We concentrate on those things that are important. If we can make the camera mimic this visual experience, we can influence how someone viewing our photographs will react or feel. Now, step back and look at the whole table, without concentrating on any one object. You perceive that all three objects are there, but you really don't notice the detail in any one of them. How would it be if we, as the photographer, decided what's important to look at? Painters have been doing this for hundreds of years. The artist decides where you focus your attention. It may be a face, it may be an orange on a table, it may be everything. But the difference between a snapshot and an artistic photograph is having the tools that enable us to make choices. We'll discuss composition later, but for now, let's concentrate on controlling this thing called depth of field. Many of you know all about depth of field. Your old 35mm film camera did the same thing. 
The only problem is most of us never spend the thousands of dollars in film and processing costs necessary to learn how to get the most out of the camera. Instead, most film shooters turn their cameras on full automatic. So we ended up with a lot of people taking snapshots on very expensive gear capable of doing so much more. Then the digital age came along and with it affordable digital cameras. At last, we could take all the pictures we wanted and review them instantly. We could take more pictures if we didn't like the results, but go back and look at all those digital images you took with your point and shoot digital camera. Everything is in focus. We were taking digital snapshots. There was minimal control of depth of field. Why? Digital point and shoot cameras focus the image on a tiny image sensor. Notice how small the lens is compared to your new SLR camera. The tiny lens focusing on a tiny chip results in images that have an infinite depth of field. Your new digital SLR has a larger sensor. The depth of field possible is much closer to what the human eye sees, just like in the old 35mm film cameras. So here's the great thing about the digital SLR. You can control the qualities of the image with this new technology. You can see the results immediately. If you don't like the picture, adjust the settings and take another. You can store your photos on your computer and print beautifully detailed 8x10 prints or larger. And there are no film or processing costs. Finish watching this presentation and practice for a couple of hours on your own. You'll have more confidence with better results than you dream possible. Now we're ready to cover the aperture value setting. You'll be adjusting the lens opening and the camera will do the rest by adjusting the shutter speed. Move the mode dial to AV and look through the viewfinder. Press the shutter halfway down to focus. On the lower portion of your viewfinder, you'll see shutter and aperture information. Again, the main dial controls the aperture value. This time, if the shutter speed blinks in the viewfinder, it indicates a setting that will not produce a properly exposed photo. Simply turn the main dial in the opposite direction until the shutter speed quits blinking. Once this happens, you can take a properly exposed image. There are four factors that determine the depth of field in a photograph. If you understand these, controlling what is in or out of focus will be much easier. You can achieve a short depth of field by using an open aperture by standing close to the subject being photographed, by using a long focal length lens, and by using a camera with a large image sensor, as we have discussed before. What would we use aperture priority for? As we discussed previously, aperture is a determining factor in setting the depth of field. Sometimes you want an infinite depth of field, or deep focus. Other times you want a shallow depth of field. Your composition, subject matter, and context all play a role in finding the right balance. Experiment with taking pictures at different apertures. Here's an example. Have your subject stand about 8 feet in front of a background of plants. Stand about 6 feet from the person and zoom your lens to 100 millimeters. This is often considered a good portrait focal length. Set the mode dial to aperture value and open the lens up using the main dial. Take a picture. Next, dial the aperture closed. Take the same picture. How do the two pictures differ? Not just what is out of focus, but how do you feel about the main subject? Is one picture better than the other? Is one more pleasing to you? There is a button on the front of your camera next to the lens called the Depth of Field Preview button. Your manual explains what it is, but doesn't really explain its use. The depth of field preview button is the last thing we'll cover before we move on to more advanced topics. When you look through the viewfinder, you would expect to be seeing exactly what the image sensor inside the camera will see when you fire off the shutter. This unfortunately isn't exactly true. Although you are looking through the lens, the camera leaves the aperture wide open until you snap the picture. This allows you to have a nice bright view through the viewfinder. Leave the mode on aperture value. Now close the aperture. The view through the viewfinder does not change. Now press the depth of field preview button. This allows you to see through the viewfinder what is going on with the aperture. 
the viewfinder becomes darker and the depth of field changes. Why do we need to use the depth of field preview button? To see how the exposed image will look. No surprises. The depth of field extends in front of the subject you're taking as well as behind it. You don't want any unseen object, such as a branch in the foreground, intruding into your composition. If the background is going to be more in focus than you expect, it may ruin your composition or your reason for taking the picture in the first place. You can use the Depth of Field Preview button to balance the relationship between your subject and background. In this way, you can use the button as a creative aid for better compositions. Learning to use this button, even if you're using program mode, will help you get better images on a more consistent basis. Now that you understand how and why to control the shutter and aperture, turn your camera back to program mode. We know that setting the mode dial to P will automatically set the shutter and aperture for a correctly exposed image. But by using the control dial, you can extend the program mode's usefulness. Turning the control dial in one direction opens the aperture and shortens the shutter speed. Turning it in the opposite direction closes down the aperture and lengthens the time the shutter stays open. Now you can more easily control the qualities of the photo while staying in program mode. As you begin to use these less automated features, you may end up with some pictures that aren't as clear as you'd like. They may even be blurry. Most often, it's not the fault of the camera or lens. It indicates you need a faster shutter speed. But what's fast enough to avoid blur? I'm going to give you a quick guideline that works very well. If your camera is not on a tripod, you must shoot with a faster shutter speed than the reciprocal of the focal length. Here's how it works. Say your lens is set to 50 millimeters. You need to shoot faster than 1 over 50 or 1 50th of a second. Say 1 60th of a second. If your lens is at 100 millimeters, you must shoot faster than 1 100th of a second. Say 1 1 25th of a second. 30 millimeters would mean 1 30th or faster. Remember this little tip and you'll be shooting a much higher percentage of sharp pictures. We have one more topic to cover in this introductory section, then we'll switch gears. You've already learned how to take better pictures simply by selecting an exposure mode and turning the control dials. Now we'll look at the most common setting changes for the Digital Rebel XT. These settings are accessed by pushing one of these buttons and turning the main dial. We'll cover about half the buttons now, the other half in the advanced section. We'll also look at one setting that is accessed through the LCD monitor. Before we adjust anything, you need to understand how the designers of this camera have set up the buttons and controls. All the controls that affect the camera in shooting mode have a silver label. The controls that work during viewing photos are blue. All the shooting mode controls are together on the back of the camera on the right hand side. The first setting is the drive button. This is the only button that works like a toggle. Push the button down while looking at the LCD panel. On the right hand side we see a small single box. Push the button again and the drive mode changes. Choices here are single shot, continuous shooting and self timer. Refer to your manual for a complete description of the self timer. Most new owners of the Digital Rebel XT either choose single or continuous shooting mode. In continuous shooting mode, the camera will continue to fire off the shutter as long as the shutter release is held down. Next, we'll look at the ISO button. Again, we press the button. This time, we will turn the main dial. On the LCD monitor, the ISO value changes. The value range is 100 to 1600. On a film camera, ISO refers to film speed. This, of course, is a digital camera. There is no film. The designers of all digital cameras decided to use this old convention from the film world to describe electronic sensor gain. This is when the camera artificially amplifies the signal to obtain a clearer picture. You may have made videotapes in extremely low light situations. Images on the tape can be seen, but the overall quality of the video is not very good. The image is captured by electronically enhancing the sensor. 
when you put your Digital Rebel XT in full automatic mode, the camera determines the amount of electronic amplification to apply. More amplification introduces more electronic noise to your image. To reduce this, the Digital Rebel XT limits the ISO speed in the basic zone modes between 100 and 400. This is even true in the sports setting. Because we're taking control of the camera, we can set this ourselves. If you are new to this, we'll keep it simple for now. If you are inside or taking sports shots with fast shutter speeds, set the ISO to 200 or 400. For outdoor photography on sunny days, set it to 100. The ISO setting gives the camera the range in which to operate. These guidelines are just a starting point. Experiment with any of the five available ISO settings. You want to introduce as little amplification as possible and still be able to operate the shutter quickly enough to give you a clear picture. We'll come back to ISO in the advanced section of this presentation. Push the menu button and select the shooting menu. Use the main dial or arrow pad to select quality. Press the set button and use the main dial to choose format. You can either shoot a JPEG raw by itself or a combination of raw with a large JPEG file. The JPEG setting determines two things. The first, fine or normal, determines how much compression to apply to the image. Fine applies very little compression, while normal applies quite a bit, making the resulting file smaller. The second, L, M, or S, determines how many pixels will be contained in the resulting file. Refer to Chapter 3 of your manual for a full explanation of file sizes and formats. We've just covered a lot of material, and now we're going to put everything into context. You decide to take a series of pictures. You've already set everything up in the LCD monitor like date and file format. Nothing to change there. Step 1 is complete. Do we want to control shutter or aperture? Set the mode dial. In this case, we'll select aperture value. Are we indoors or out? Here, we're indoors. Set the ISO to 400. We don't have to touch these again until something changes, either our location or the situation. So far, pretty simple. Next, we frame up our shot, set the AF point, adjust the aperture with the main dial, double check the shutter speed, and take the shot. I understand all this information takes a little getting used to, but the result will be consistently better photographs. We're going to switch topics now and spend some time talking about composition. The more advanced topics later in this video will build on the foundation we've already presented. Feel free to take a break now and experiment with your camera. As photographers, our goal is to convey our personal outlook and view of the world in the form of photographs. Good picture composition can help you express your visual ideas. Following these guidelines of composition won't guarantee award-winning photographs, but I can promise you this, your pictures will improve. I'm not asking you to memorize the rules and follow them by rote, although this might not be such a bad idea if you're a beginner. You probably have a friend or relative who always seems to have a stack of vacation or holiday snapshots. In every batch, there may be one or two interesting pictures, but the rest are pretty boring. Most people simply don't know how to make their pictures interesting. They don't know how to arrange their subjects and backgrounds in an appealing way. That's what we're going to discuss now. The principles of good picture making, or composition, can be learned. As you look at a potential picture through the viewfinder, move the camera around. Find the best picture. Also, zoom with your feet. Moving a short distance can sometimes make all the difference. Avoid placing the subject smack in the center of the picture. Here is a concept that will really help you find the best arrangement of picture elements. It is called the rule of thirds and has been used by artists for hundreds of years. Divide the horizontal plane and the vertical plane into thirds. The intersections of these lines are the best places to locate important subjects. If you have a subject with prominent lines or edges, such as a building or a seascape, 
place them along the rule of thirds lines. A few words about horizons. Never allow the horizon to cross the picture plane exactly in the middle. If you want to feature a subject that lies above the horizon, such as a beautiful sunset, place the horizon lower than the center line. If your main area of interest is below the horizon, arrange the shot so that the horizon is higher than the center line. Teach yourself to visualize the thirds when you're looking at photographs and artwork. You'll notice that professional photographers use this concept all the time. You'll also see the rule of thirds in television commercials, movies, and documentaries. A problem with so many snapshots is that the people are so tiny you can hardly tell who they are. The photographer has tried to cram a lot of information about who and where into one photograph. It doesn't work. The solution is to get specific with your pictures. Fill the frame with important stuff, the people, and enough of the surrounding details to identify the location. Then, take additional pictures to explore the place, the view, the architecture, the food. A photograph, like a painting or a drawing, is a two-dimensional object. How do you depict the three-dimensional world on two-dimensional paper? How do you avoid a flat look to your pictures? There are things you can do to help the viewer see the third dimension. Rule number one, you must understand the technical aspects of focusing your camera. Focus is the most important component of making a good picture. The sharp edges and clarity of the focused subject engages the eye of the viewer. To make your area of sharp focus even more forceful, contrast it against an area of softer focus. To control the line between sharp and soft focus, you must understand depth of field and put it to work in your pictures. The contrast of a sharply focused subject against a soft background will greatly intensify the illusion of three dimensions. A few more tips that add depth. If possible, take advantage of overlapping objects. Overlaps show that one object is in front of another object in space. Use this trick to give your photographs the feeling of space and depth in the real world. Elements of perspective can be used to enhance the third dimension. Things like a line of fence posts going away from you, or a row of arches in a building, or a road winding off into a distance. Buildings can be a great source of perspective clues. Look at what happens with walls and roof lines as they rise up and away from you. These are all indications that the scene has space and depth. We've talked about a number of things that you can do to improve your photographs through composition which will help you place the subject in the picture plane. We talked about sharp and soft focus and discussed ways to create depth and space. We have only begun to touch on the subject of photographic composition. If you'd like to find out more, complete books on the subject are available. The internet is also an excellent resource. Use these guidelines and you'll be thinking about photographs in a new way. We're going to cover several subjects in this section. These advanced topics build on the things you've already learned. Don't worry if this section doesn't make total sense now. Many of the advanced Digital Rebel XT features will be things you grow into after you've mastered the basics. Shoot with your camera for a while. Come back and review this section in a few weeks. I guarantee all the pieces will fall into place. <laughs> White balance is a topic that can either be very simple or a little more involved, based on your needs as a photographer. Happily, the Digital Rebel XT gives you white balance settings that work well under a variety of conditions. First, a short explanation of color temperature. When we shoot photographs, we can have a variety of light sources, each with its own characteristics. Color temperature refers to the spectrum of the visible light illuminating an object. We refer to the measurement of the light spectrum with something called Kelvin temperature. Kelvin temperature refers to the color given off by carbon when it's heated to a specific temperature. At 2000 degrees centigrade, carbon glows red, but when it's heated to 5600 degrees, it's white hot. Take the sun for instance. When it's shining directly overhead, we perceive white daylight. The Earth's atmosphere allows the entire visible spectrum of light to pass through and illuminate our world, resulting in a higher color temperature, about 5600 degrees Kelvin. An hour after sunrise, or an hour before sunset, 
The curvature of the atmosphere changes the light reaching us. The atmosphere filters out the short wavelength colors like violet and blue and we experience more of a golden color. In this case, the color temperature is lower, about 2900 degrees. We've all seen a red sunset or the golden light that is so beautiful an hour before the sun goes down. The light given off by incandescent bulbs is similar to the light we see an hour before sunset. In contrast, candlelight is very red with a very low color temperature. Think of how your friends look sitting in front of a fireplace. We're not talking about the intensity of the light, rather the composition of the light spectrum. Then again, fluorescent light is completely different, with large amounts of green color being emitted. Most of the time, we want to represent the true color of something. We want the people in our pictures to have natural skin tones. The Digital Rebel XT has many settings for white balance. Each is designed to compensate for the light source. Let's look at auto white balance first. In this setting, the camera meters the light coming through the lens and compensates for the color temperature being recorded. The auto white balance causes the exposure to appear as if it was made under natural sunlight. In cloudy daylight conditions where there is a lot of blue light, auto white balance filters out the blue, shifting the colors back toward the red and yellow range. If you are shooting indoors under incandescent or firelight, the auto white balance shifts the camera back toward the blue range. This shift results in skin tones that look natural. If you want this natural sunlight look, the auto white balance setting does a remarkable job. For many photographers, this is a setting that never gets changed. But you can use the preset white balance settings to create better photographs before you upload the images into your computer. Let's say you're taking a walk just before sunset. The light is making everything a beautiful golden color. The shadows are fantastic. If you are shooting JPEG images in auto white balance mode, the camera will shift everything toward blue to compensate for the yellow light. Then it will compress your image and store it on your compact flash card. The beautiful light is gone. You can use software to shift the color back toward the yellow-orange range later, but it's work that can be avoided. You'll also be losing data from your original image. Why? Well, the program you use to shift the colors will recompress your JPEG file, losing even more data. You may decide to print this photo, but you've already given data away twice. If you set the white balance correctly at the time you take the photo, you won't have to spend time fixing it later. In order to understand exactly what the white balance setting does, we have to do a little experiment. Go outside and pick a subject to photograph. You can toggle through the different settings for white balance by pressing the button labeled WB and rotating the main dial. Take exactly the same picture on each setting. Review the photos on your computer. As you scroll through the photos you took, you'll notice that several have a strange color cast. Look at the photo you took with the fluorescent setting. Remember how I said that fluorescent light often contains a large amount of green? Does your picture have a slightly purple cast? The fluorescent setting acts as a filter to reduce the green spectrum the camera was expecting. You have to think about it backwards. The camera shifts the color slightly toward the purple side to compensate for the extra green in the fluorescent light. Since you took this picture outdoors rather than under a fluorescent fixture, the resulting image has too much purple. So if you're shooting an hour before sunset and you want to capture that golden light, try setting the white balance to cloudy rather than auto. The camera will expect light that has a higher Kelvin temperature, about 6000 degrees. Since the real color temperature is lower, say 2900 degrees, the camera will record more of the yellow-orange light your eye perceives. One small point before we move on. You can fine-tune the white balance settings by accessing the WB shift bracket selection in the shooting menu. Use the arrow pad to shift the image toward amber or blue. You can also combine this with a color shift that is more green or purple. You may find that people look more attractive when the image is slightly warm. This camera also allows you to set the white balance manually. Many owners of the Digital Rebel XT will never use this feature, but you should know why it's important. 
if you are going to be taking several photos indoors and there are different kinds of light illuminating your subjects you may find the auto white balance will not produce accurate colors and since daylight varies in color temperature based on the position of the sun in the sky the sunlight white balance setting won't be correct either rather than color correct all the photos after they're in your computer you may elect to white balance the camera manually this will give you true colors under any lighting conditions whether you want accurate skin tones are shooting product photos or just wish to avoid color correcting later to set the custom white balance follow three steps set the focus switch on the lens to manual fill the viewfinder with a white object that is lit with the same source as your subject manually focus on the white object take a picture and now you can set your lens back to autofocus on the shooting menu toggle down to custom WB the camera automatically opens the last picture you took in this case it's the white sheet of paper press the set key this stores the white balance settings in the camera press the WB button and rotate the main dial until the custom white balance icon appears all your pictures will now be correctly balanced to the available light where you are shooting as with the preset white balance settings you can shift the white balance by accessing the shooting menu you can choose between three settings to control how the camera focuses the lens we have discussed using AF points and letting the camera decide where to focus but how do you decide when to focus you may be taking a portrait of someone standing completely still or you may be at the zoo where an animal's movement is unpredictable the digital rubble XT has settings for each of these situations and one for everything in between press the AF button and turn the main dial the LCD panel shows you three options the first is one shot one shot freezes the focus when you press the shutter release halfway down if a proper focus is obtained the focus indicator in the viewfinder displays as a solid disk this setting is good for still objects like portraits or buildings the third option is AI servo with this setting the camera will continue to search for the correct focus behind the selected AF point until the shutter release is fired or released this setting is great for constantly moving objects like small children or animals the second choice is something in between AI focus starts out just like one shot it will focus and stay locked on the subject behind the AF point if the subject moves the camera switches over to AI servo continuously focusing on the subject once the camera changes to AI servo mode the focus indicator will not light in some situations for instance with extremely backlit subjects you may wish to lock the exposure we'll be talking more about metering in a few minutes but for now let's look at the auto exposure and auto focus lock button next to the AF point selection button the default setting for this button allows you to lock the exposure setting before taking a photo this may be necessary in high contrast situations this button can also be programmed in a variety of ways we'll cover all of this in the custom function settings section of this presentation metering refers to how the camera sets the exposure for your photo the digital rebel XT allows you to select how much of the frame the camera uses to measure the light for setting the exposure this can only be changed when the camera is in a creative zone setting either P A V T V A D E P or M the default setting is called evaluative metering once the main subject and background are determined based on the AF point the rest of the frame is also considered this is the correct metering setting to use in most situations even with some backlighting the next option is partial metering here the camera uses the center of the frame for its measurement the four center AF points in the frame define the parameter of this metering option the last option is center weighted average metering the camera will still look at the entire frame but will consider the area in the center of the frame to be the most important so if your subject is extremely backlit or there are different light sources in the frame or if the contrast is very high you can meter on a specific subject then you lock the exposure with the AE lock button 
reframe your photo, and take the picture. You may ask why focusing and metering are in the advanced section. These settings are not particularly hard to understand. But step back for a moment and look at all the controls together. One shot or AI servo autofocus, AF points, metering options, and AE lock or AF lock. You won't need them all the time, but understanding how they work will make the Digital Rebel XT a more versatile tool when you're faced with unusual lighting. Bracketing is a carryover from the film days when you couldn't afford to miss a shot. Bracketing allows you to take multiple pictures with different under and over exposure settings. On the shooting menu, use the main dial to highlight the AEB setting. Push the set button to select the bracketing control. Turn the main dial to set the range for the bracketed photos. Press the set button again. Exposure bracketing is now enabled for the camera. The LCD panel and viewfinder will now show your bracketing settings by placing two additional indicators under the analog metering display. In most cases, you can use the tools we've already discussed, center weighted or partial metering, to ensure your subject is properly exposed. But if it's the shot of a lifetime, you may want to bracket, just to make sure you get the best image possible. You can also bracket for white balance if you wish. Refer to your manual for a complete description of how these two bracketing options work together. Many digital photographers never use bracketing. They feel the photos they take can be manipulated well enough using the image processing programs on their computer. But others feel that with no film or processing costs, it can't hurt. So if it makes you feel more confident, go ahead and bracket away. Next, we'll cover exposure compensation. Typically, this is used when the subject is either much brighter or much darker than the background. Hold down the exposure compensation button in any creative zone mode except full manual, and the main dial will under or overexpose the image. Just remember this one point. The exposure compensation will remain in effect if you switch to another creative zone mode or even if you turn the camera off. You must either return the exposure compensation back to zero or reset the camera from setup menu two. If you choose the full manual mode, the camera gives you control over aperture and shutter. Turning the main dial in manual mode changes the shutter, just like in shutter priority mode. To change the aperture, hold in the exposure compensation button and turn the main dial. This mode gives you total control over exposure, aperture, and shutter speed. Because of this, there is no exposure compensation control in manual mode. Manual mode can be useful if you are trying to achieve a specific effect, or if you have lighting situations that require manual underexposure to retain details. The tools we just covered, metering modes, AE lock, exposure compensation, manual mode, and bracketing all do one thing, each in a very different way. They allow you, as the photographer, to override the exposure the camera would normally select. In the software section of this presentation, we will discuss the use of several tools to adjust your photos. To preserve the best image quality possible, you should remember this one point. Any adjustment you make to a JPEG file takes data away from the original image. A way to preserve data is to take advantage of the information available on the LCD monitor. There are three different displays available after you take a picture. One shows the full photo in the LCD monitor without any information. The second shows minimal information superimposed over the photo. The third display shows overexposed areas by making them blink and displays quite a few of the camera settings as well as a histogram. Toggle through the displays by pressing the info button next to the LCD monitor. The histogram will show you whether your picture has good tonal definition and if your exposure is indeed right for your subject. A typical photo will have most of its information in the midtones, not the shadows or highlights. The histogram in this case will look like a bell curve with most of the data in the middle. If your photo has a lot of dark values, a good exposure will be weighted toward the left side of the histogram. 
Consider the photo, then compare it to the histogram. In this case, I purposely overexposed a lighting fixture. I want you to notice two things. First, there is a spike in the histogram on the right hand side, indicating data has been lost from the highlights. Second, the image display blinks wherever the image is overexposed. These areas have values that could not be captured by the camera. Consequently, the data is lost forever. If you see blinking in small areas of the image, you're probably okay. But in this image, we have blown out all the detail in the highlights. Because of this instant feedback, you can make adjustments to your exposure on the spot and ensure you are getting the best image possible. Think back to the exposure compensation button. A quick adjustment with this control can help capture more of the values in the image. The pop-up speed light that is built into the Digital Rebel XT can be a great tool for increasing the quality of your photographs under a variety of lighting conditions. We can configure the flash unit to enhance our pictures, rather than giving us the typical blown out flash look we've all seen in snapshots. Most beginning photographers use the flash on their camera when they're indoors under low light. Here's a tip. Use your flash outside under bright sunny skies. The flash will fill in some of the harsh shadows created by the sun. The Digital Rebel XT allows you to configure the flash to work in a variety of situations. You can also configure the intensity of the flash. Access the Shooting Menu 2 on the back of the camera and toggle down to Flash Exposure Compensation. Moving the indicator to the underexposed side of the meter will decrease the flash intensity a typical fill flash. Move it in the other direction toward overexposure and the flash intensity will increase to illuminate the subject. In the same way we use the exposure lock button to correctly meter a subject, we can use the flash exposure lock to evaluate a subject before we fire off a shot. Raise the speed light, focus your subject in the center of the frame and push the exposure lock button. The camera's speed light will fire off a flash without taking a picture. It will then store the correct flash value in the camera's memory. Reframe the subject and take the picture. The flash will be correct for the subject you metered. You may see the term slow sync in reference to using speed lights or flash units. This refers to the shutter speed necessary for the flash unit to illuminate both the subject and the background. Whenever you operate the speed light, the camera will automatically adjust the shutter speed or aperture to ensure that both the subject and background are illuminated. For the Digital Rebel XT, the shutter must fire in 1 200th of a second or slower. If you don't care about the illumination of the background, you can turn this automatic control off in the custom function settings of your camera. This will allow you to operate the flash and aperture value mode with the shutter locked at 1 200th of a second. We'll cover custom functions next. Many photographers appreciate the power and flexibility of the Digital Rebel XT, even on its default settings. The designers of this camera understand, however, that different photographers have different needs and different approaches. If your interest is sports, your style of shooting will dictate a different approach than a portrait or nature photographer. This is where camera customization can make the Digital Rebel XT an easier tool for you to use. The Custom Functions menu allows you to change the way certain buttons or features of the camera operate. We'll go through a few that you might find useful. Access the Custom Functions menu from the Setup menu. Press the Set key. The next screen looks a little different than the menu selections we've reviewed before. In the top right hand corner of the LCD monitor, the custom function number is displayed. Just below it is a short description of the function. We recommend you refer to your user manual for a complete description of each custom function. At the bottom of the screen we can see at a glance all nine custom function numbers and whether each is set differently than the factory default. A zero under the custom function number indicates the default setting. Use the main dial to select the custom function you wish to change. Press the set key. Next, turn the main dial again to change the value for the selected custom function. Press the set key again. The custom function now changes the operation of the camera as described by your user manual. 
Custom Function 1 allows you to change the function of the set button when shooting. This, in effect, gives you a programmable button on the outside of the camera. The default for the button is to do nothing. But CF1 allows the button to change the quality, the shooting parameters, display the menu, replay the captured images, or my favorite, to allow the arrow pad to change the AF point without pressing the AF point button first. This gives you quick and immediate control over where the camera will focus, leaving the main dial free to adjust shutter or aperture. As you grow into the camera, you may find one or more of the options fit your shooting style better. Custom Function 2 is handy if you take a lot of pictures under low light, like night landscapes. For long exposure photos, the camera will reduce the noise that is inherent in exposures longer than one second. Custom Function 3 allows you to fire the flash mechanism with shutter speeds locked in at 1 200th of a second. This can be handy if you don't care about illuminating the background with the flash. This function only works in aperture value mode. Custom Function 4 is perhaps the most difficult to understand, yet one of the most powerful custom functions on the camera. It allows you to configure how the shutter button and AE lock button work together. Spend some time with this custom function in your manual to understand all the options. Custom Function 7 allows you to use mirror lockup. This can give you clear pictures if you're using extremely long lenses, say over 300 mm or when performing close-up photography. There are, of course, other custom functions, each designed to address specific shooting conditions and styles. Review them all when you feel confident with the basic controls. As we discussed before, you can always reset the camera back to its default settings from the setup menu. Simply choose Reset Custom Functions. Closely related to the custom functions, the parameter selection allows you to customize the tonal qualities of the image as it's processed and stored on your CF card. Qualities like contrast, sharpness, saturation, and color tone can be adjusted in one of three custom parameter settings. For instance, if you shoot portraits, you probably want less sharpness than someone who shoots insects. Selecting a parameter setting may reduce the number of changes necessary once you get the images onto your computer. If you like to shoot black and white images, the black and white parameter settings are very interesting. They allow you to emulate different colored filters as well as adjusting tonal qualities. Your user manual does a good job explaining these settings. The Digital Rebel XT is powered by a small lithium-ion battery. This is a powerful battery that holds a large charge. You may have purchased a spare, and that was a good idea. Just be sure you always carry the spare battery with its protective plastic cover in place. Any metal object that touches the exposed contacts can start a fire. And that's not a good idea. I want to talk about filters that you can use with your Digital Rebel XT. Even though digital technology is great, there are limitations. I'm going to show you how you can deal with some of these by using a physical filter. Let's say you're standing outside looking at this scene. Your eyes have the ability to see detail in a scene even if the brightest object is 100 times brighter than the darkest object. Film can record bright detail 15 times brighter than the darkest object in the frame. Digital sensors have even less latitude or dynamic range. When we look at a histogram, we see the dynamic range of the camera. Unfortunately, many situations present a wider dynamic range than current digital technology can handle. In this example, we either have to sacrifice the detail in the bright clouds or the detail in the darkest shadows. This is a filter system made by Koken. It attaches quickly and allows any combinations of filters to be held in front of the lens. This filter is useful, especially if you shoot outdoors often. It's called an ND or Neutral Density Filter. It reduces the amount of light without changing its color characteristics. Notice on this filter that the top is dark and the bottom is light. If you place the dark part in front of the lens, you get a wider range of shutter speeds under bright, sunny conditions. This can really be useful if you're trying to use a fill flash outside. Remember, the shutter must fire at 1 200th of a second or slower. This lets you knock down the sunlight coming through the lens, so you can shoot slow enough to add fill flash. 
Use the graduated section when you have a bright sky and a dark ground. Now you can capture all the details in the scene, effectively bringing all the highlights and shadows into the range the image sensor can record. If you shoot outside often, you may want to check out a polarizing filter. It will remove or reduce glare and shiny reflections, just like a pair of polarizing sunglasses. Koken also makes one of these that can be used alone or in conjunction with their ND or other filter. Take your digital SLR to your local camera professional to try out these products. Koken makes close to 200 filters that can be used in this system. You may find some of them to help you make better images. Now we're going to turn our attention to software. But first, let's talk about getting the pictures into the computer. You can transfer the files directly from your camera to your computer by plugging in the supplied wire into the USB port. The connection is pretty fast, but you'll use camera battery power throughout the download. We recommend you purchase a USB 2 card reader, similar to the one shown here. Card readers are inexpensive and can stay connected to your computer all the time. Simply insert the compact flash card into the reader. If you use a card reader, you can leave your camera in its bag. In addition, the transfer rate will be just as fast as if you use the camera and supplied cable. For much of this section, we'll be looking at Photoshop elements. Although the software doesn't come bundled with your camera, many photographers already own it. We like this software because it handles JPEGs, RAWs, has great organizing tools, gives you flexibility when printing, and has keyword search capabilities. We'll also look at the software that came with your camera, Digital Photo Professional for processing RAW files, and Photo Studio for general image manipulation and printing. One last thought about archiving your photographs. There are a few habits we encourage. First, move your photos from the camera to the computer as soon as possible after a photo session. Once the photos are safely stored on the computer, get your equipment ready for your next photo shoot. Clear the stored images from the camera by formatting the CF card. Place the CF card into the Digital Rebel XT. Select Format from the Setup 1 menu on the LCD monitor. Press the Set button and select OK. Press the Set button to finish formatting. If you already own Photoshop CS, most of this discussion will apply, although the interface to the program will look slightly different. The procedure for processing JPEGs is a little different from processing RAWs, so we'll present them in separate sections. JPEG is the name of an image storage format. JPEG compression uses what is called a lossy algorithm. This means that only selected bits of information about a picture are stored in a JPEG file. As a result of the compression algorithm, JPEG files are stored in a much smaller space than it would take to save everything. Here is what you need to remember about JPEGs. Every time you make changes to a JPEG file and resave it, the system does a new compression on the file. After several compressions, a file starts to develop impurities called artifacts, halos, outlines, and other electronic junk that you didn't put there. A good plan of attack, before you begin to work on your JPEG and Photoshop elements, is to make a copy of it in the PSD format. Saving and resaving the PSD file will not create artifacts, because these formats don't use compression. If you need to email the picture or put it on the internet, save it as a JPEG when you're done working on it. In your Elements 3.0 package from Adobe, you'll find an introductory movie. Be sure to watch it as it explains how to navigate between the organizer workspace and the editor workspace inside of Elements. It also gets the viewer started categorizing and labeling a collection of digital photos and using the powerful search capabilities of Elements 3. Some of the automatic editing tools are covered, such as Quick Fix and Smart Fix. This intro also touches on various ways of formatting and printing your photos and including them in the body of an email message. It will take you about a half an hour to watch the movie, and what you learn will make it well worth the effort. Adobe has included four useful tutorials under the Help menu, including one I strongly recommend if you are new to Photoshop programs. 
It is called Harness the Power of Layers, and it will get you familiar with the nuts and bolts of the layers concept. This is one subject you'll need to know if you hope to progress beyond the most basic functions of the program. More tutorials can be found on the Adobe website. With version 3 of Elements, Adobe has created two workspaces, the Organizer and the Editor. The first time you open Elements, you'll see the Welcome screen with a number of choices. Choose Organize and View Photos to bring up the Organizer. Use the camera icon to load the Organizer with your photos from files, CDs, or from your camera. As the photos are loaded, Elements will build an index which includes a thumbnail pointing to each of your photos. To edit a photo, select it in the Organizer, then bring up the Editor. Under the Edit icon, you may choose either Go to Standard Edit or Go to Quick Fix. For now, choose Go to Quick Fix. Here, Adobe has grouped together some of its most useful tools that will allow you to rotate your image and to manipulate lighting, color, and sharpness. The beauty of Quick Fix is that you can try out the various settings and see how they work together before you actually commit to the changes. Be sure to try the Smart Fix option, which automatically corrects overall color balance and improves shadow and highlight detail. The Smart Fix slider lets you vary the amount of adjustment. Set the view to Before and After so you can compare the image you are working on to the original. Now, select the Standard Edit option to take a look at a few more tools. The Crop Tool may be the single most useful feature available for changing average, unexciting photographs into stunning images. The Crop Tool is found in the Toolbox. It consists of a box with adjustable sides. Place the box over your image and move it around. Adjust the sides to create a pleasing composition. When you have found an arrangement you like, press Enter. The material outside the box will disappear. The preset options at the top of the work area allow you to crop to a specific size, such as a 4 by 6 inch sheet of photo paper. Don't be afraid to experiment. Any changes you decide you don't like can be erased using the Undo function, Control Z. You may also use Undo History, found in the Window menu. Under the Enhance menu, you'll find some powerful tools for color correction and tonal adjustment. Four of the tools have an automatic setting, Auto Smart Fix, Auto Levels, Auto Contrast, and Auto Color Correction. When you use one of the automatic versions, the Element software will examine your image and based on certain assumptions, it will make improvements according to its own algorithms. Sometimes the software is very successful and the results look good, especially with average pictures. So give these tools a try, but use your own judgment in deciding what really looks pleasing. Remember, it's easy to cancel any changes you decide you don't like. The Undo function, Control Z, takes you back for as many levels as you specified in History States under Edit Preferences. Or you can simply use Undo History, found under the Window menu. Another powerful tool is Color Variations, found under Enhance Adjust Color. Variations allow you to apply specific color changes for the highlights, midtones, and shadows of your image. You can also lighten and darken the image and change the color saturation. Use the slider control to affect the intensity of your changes. For those who prefer an even finer control of color and tonal adjustment, check out the Levels tool, found under Enhance and then under Adjust Lighting. In the Levels tool, you can adjust the range of dark and light values over an entire image. You can also adjust the range of values across a color channel. The histogram is a graphic representation of the way values are distributed in an image, with the dark values on the left end and the light values on the right. Use the input level sliders to distribute highlights and shadows more evenly across the range of the image. The histogram will show you where values are missing. For instance, you may have an image where the highlights have been dulled by atmospheric conditions. Brighten up the image by moving the highlight slider to the left to the place where the values start showing. The shadow slider works the same way, except that you move the slider to the right, to the area where the values start to show. The histogram is also available as three separate color channels, red, green, and blue. You can modify the values in one of the three color channels by choosing it from the drop-down list box. 
This is helpful if you have, say, a green color cast where you would like to lessen the green in the mid-range but don't want to affect the mid-range blues and reds. Once you've adjusted levels to your satisfaction, you can use the output slider to further affect the entire image. Think of the ends of the output slider as the brightest lights to the right and the deepest darks to the left. Moving the sliders toward the middle will make the overall image a little less light or a little less dark. Version 3 of Elements also has included some nice enhancements to its Red Eye Fix tool and included the Healing Brush and Spot Healing Brush from Photoshop CS. An important thing to remember about photographic image files is this. Never disturb the original files. Once they're in the computer, always preserve them the way they came from the camera. If you want to make some modifications, and many times you will, Simply make a copy and then make changes to the copy. Always adhere to this approach. Someday you'll be glad that you have the original files. Now I'm going to discuss files in the RAW format. They are handled differently from the JPEG files. A RAW file consists of data as it comes directly from the camera with no formatting. Compare it to a JPEG file. JPEGs have been arranged by the computer in a universally agreed upon format so that many different kinds and brands of devices can read it. RAW files, on the other hand, are arranged in a proprietary format. Those from a Canon digital camera will be different from another manufacturer's RAW files. A RAW file contains all the data describing an image, just as it comes from the camera. Virtually no compression takes place, so a RAW file is very large. It is the most complete image your camera can make and gives you a wealth of data to work with. At the time of this production, Adobe had not yet released a RAW plugin for the XT. We assume version 2.5 will be able to handle XT files when it's available. To check your camera RAW plugin version, click on Help, About Plugin, Camera RAW, and an information box will pop up with the version number. To search for a newer RAW plugin, Follow these steps. Click on Support, Downloads, and pick the product Photoshop Elements. Under version 3, select the camera RAW plugin and follow the directions for installation. Now that we have the correct plugin, we can open up the .cr2 file the camera created. Double click on the RAW file you want to edit and the application opens the camera RAW plugin. Here you have a tremendous amount of adjustment flexibility. Happily, the settings are quite intuitive. Under Settings, you can choose from the selected image, the camera default, a previous conversion, or custom. For this first photo, we'll pick custom. If we had a series of raw photos that had been taken under similar conditions, we could adjust the rest by selecting previous conversion after the first photo was complete. Next, we can change the white balance setting and fine tune it with the slide bars that control Kelvin temperature and tint. This point is very important and the biggest difference between RAW and JPEG files. When you set these RAW parameters, it's as if you're going back in time to the moment the shot was made. The camera has stored only the data recorded on the sensor and the information about how the camera was set up at the time of the photograph. When you shoot JPEGs, the camera applies the settings before saving the file. Here, you are applying the settings to the raw data after the file has been written to your computer. You are not losing any data if you adjust any of these values. So, now we can adjust exposure, shadow, brightness, contrast, saturation, sharpness, luminance smoothing and color noise reduction to our heart's content until we get the photo exactly how we want it. Press the ALT key and the cancel button becomes a reset button allowing you to cancel your changes and start again without exiting first. There are powerful tools located at the bottom of the RAW plugin. They are the clipping warning boxes. Here you can select highlights, shadows, or both. Let's look at what happens when I change the exposure settings. If the image is overexposed, the blown out areas turn red. Underexpose the image and the details in the shadows that are lost are displayed in blue. Use this tool along with the histogram to set the tonal properties of your image correctly. 
Once the raw image has its tonal property set the way you want, select OK. The image is returned to the editor workspace where you can save the file as a PSD or JPEG, print the image, or perform any other image manipulation function. If you're printing large photos, say larger than 8.5 by 11 inches, you may want to shoot in RAW format to keep as much data as possible available for your printer. Printing a single image on a page is straightforward in elements. The program is quite flexible when it comes to getting multiple pictures onto a page. First, select several photos, then bring up the standard edit screen. Elements puts the photos into the photo bin. Now select File Print and select the Multiple Images option in the upper right hand corner of the print screen. Under Option 2, select Type of Print, you can choose between a number of picture package layouts or you can print a contact sheet. The layouts can be configured in many ways and the screen shows you how the page will look before you print. Experiment to see all the possibilities. Canon bundled several pieces of software with your new Digital Rebel XT. For most of your image processing needs, you will probably turn to Photoshop Elements or Photo Studio. Canon's Digital Photo Professional allows you to display and make tonal adjustments to your raw photos shot by Canon's EOS family of digital cameras. Use this tool if you decide not to purchase Photoshop Elements. Both programs allow you to make the same adjustments to raw files. <laughs> So let's take a look at Digital Photo Professional. When you open the program, you'll see the main window. On this screen, you'll select the photo or photos you wish to adjust. At the top of the screen, you'll see a specialized toolbar. On the left side, you'll see a tree view of all the folders on your system. Click on one that contains raw photos, and you'll see the images displayed in thumbnails on the main screen. The tree can be toggled on and off with the Folders button on the toolbar. The size of the thumbnails can be controlled in the View menu or by pressing Control 1, Control 2, or Control 3. If you press Control 0, you'll get an image displayed with its shooting information. Having this size control is really great, especially if you have lots of images. Double click on an image to open it in its own window. Then use Control 1, Control 2, or Control 3 to increase the magnification. Select one or more images to edit. Use selection options in the Edit menu, use toolbar buttons, or simply use conventional Mac and Windows commands. Here I'll select four images while holding down the Control key. The best way to get the adjustment tools is to press the toolbar button, Edit Image Window. Here is the first of my selections in a large window with my other selections as thumbnails to the left of the screen. The thumbnails button on the toolbar toggles them on or off. A nice feature of this software is the ability to show the selected raw file in a split image, so you can dynamically monitor the effects of the changes you make. Choose before or after comparison from the view menu from the edit image window. Press the tool button on the toolbar to bring up the tool palette. Select the tab on top of the palette entitled Raw Image Adjustment. You'll see a group of tools which we'll discuss one by one. First, we have Adjust Brightness. This slider lightens or darkens all of the pixels in an image. Before you jump in and start using this tool, look at the other tools we're going to discuss. You may decide you don't need the Brightness Adjuster. Next comes White Balance Adjustment. Take a look at the drop-down list box where you'll see a list of all the white balance settings that are available in your camera. We've already discussed how the white balance selection affects the overall color tone of an image. I took this photo on a sunny day using automatic white balance. By applying the cloudy setting, I can warm up the image a bit. One of the settings deserves particular note, the color temperature setting. Here you are allowed to choose the actual Kelvin temperature of the light in your image. Here's another way to white balance the image. Click the click button. The cursor turns into an eyedropper. Next, click on a white or neutral gray area in the image. Click the click button again to finish. By establishing what is white, the camera can adjust the colors appropriately. There's one more tool to look at. Click on the tune button to bring up the white balance fine adjustment color wheel. 
Here you can change the hue and saturation either by changing the numbers or sliding the square. The hue setting changes by degree as you move around the circle. The saturation is greatest at the outer edge of the circle. I would describe this color wheel as a filter as if you were shining light through a color theatrical gel on your image. You can affect the image a lot or in a way that is barely perceptible. The register button in the white balance section gives you the ability to save three separate settings so you can easily compare the effects on the image. The dynamic range adjustment shows a histogram of the values in the image. In other words, how the darks and lights are spread across the image. Using the sliders at each edge of the histogram, I can move the dark point and light point to darken or lighten the image. In the Tone Curve property box, I select the custom option. A slider appears which allows me to change the shape of the curve, which will further adjust the tonal quality of the image. In the color adjustment box, I select the custom option. This presents sliders for both hue and saturation, allowing me to make a final adjustment on the image. There are a few other interesting things this software allows you to do. One is to save in a file or on the clipboard all the changes you have made to an image. The software calls these changes recipes. Once you've saved the recipes, you can apply them to other photos you may have taken under similar conditions. Most importantly, you'll want to save your raw images as a JPEG or TIFF image so that your image processing program can access it. Take the Convert and Save option under the File menu. Be careful not to overwrite your raw file. Remember, you want to preserve your original. You may take the default settings when you convert to JPEG or TIFF, but pay attention to the output setting. 350 dots per inch is going to give you a pretty large file. If you don't need all that resolution, you may just want to use the screen standard, 72 dots per inch. With your Digital Rumble XT, you receive software called ArcSoft Photo Studio, which will help you with your images after they've been downloaded into the computer. We're going to look at Photo Studio, touching on the areas of the program that can be most useful to digital photographers. Let's start with the tools that can help make tonal corrections. Here's a flower picture that looks more gray than white. We're going to fix this problem by going to the Enhance menu and choosing Brightness Contrast. All of the tonal adjustment commands in Photo Studio use the same format. A box appears that holds up before and after sample and sliders for making adjustments. The preview box lets you see your changes on screen as you make them. Toggle it on and off to compare your modifications to the original image. Trust your judgment when you're making adjustments. Use a light touch at first. A little bit of adjusting can go a long way. Once you have the image the way you like it, Press OK. Remember, you can always undo any changes using Control Z, and you can redo changes using Control Y. Now, let's look at the adjustment for hue and saturation. Like the brightness contrast command, hue saturation has before and after samples, and the adjustments are made with sliders. Adding a slight amount of saturation can frequently improve an image, but too much will give a garish artificial result. Experiment with the hue slider. There are some situations where a very slight increase in a color can perfect your image, as in this example where we intensify the green that's already present in the environment. The tone adjustment is like brightness contrast, but with the capacity for finer control. You have a slider for highlights, one for shadows, and one for midtones. Take a look at this landscape. The highlights look pretty good. The problem is, we can't really see the detail in the darks and the mid-range. We don't want to do a global adjustment to the whole image. We just want to improve the shadows and mid-range. Tone adjustment is the right tool for this job. The fourth tonal correction tool we'll look at is color balance. It's not unusual to find color casts in images. Here, an atmospheric blue tone is a result of reflections from a bright sky. The color balance command gives us a slider for each of the primary colors. Here we adjust the opposite direction of blue and cyan just until the color cast vanishes. Before we leave tonal corrections, I'd like to quickly show you four tools that can give you some creative options. 
Color reduction reduces the number of colors in your image, resulting in an interesting interpretation of the original. This is sometimes known as posterization. The number of colors can be adjusted by the slider. Color tone produces a duotone, where a selected hue is mixed with a monotone version of the image, producing a moody, thought-provoking result. Scratch remover can eliminate small blemishes from your image. In this case, we have selected and instantly removed some small specks on this primrose petal. Try the negative tool to produce an image which looks like an actual color negative made on positive film. Now, we turn to the selection tools available in Photo Studio. Selection tools are used to define an area of an image for further processing. Selections are useful for making adjustments to a portion of an image instead of the whole thing. At the top of the tools palette, we have a group of selection tools in common shapes. Rectangle, square, ellipse, and circle. You can define the size of the selection as you apply it, or you can use a fixed size by typing in the number of pixels. By the way, selections in Photo Studio are canceled or deselected by Control-N, or the None command under the Select menu. We choose the magic wand from the tools palette. The cursor becomes a wand and the tool options box appears on the screen. The magic wand isolates an area by color. In this case, we've selected this white flower. The tool option box allows us to add more colors to the selection, like the gray shadows of the flower. Now, the entire flower is selected. Using the color balance command from the enhance menu, we can remove the slight green cast from the flower petals, leaving the rest of the image intact. The lasso tool allows us to trace the perimeter of an area which is too complex to select using just color. To finish the selection, double click on the image. While you're at it, check out the magnetic lasso tool. It's just like the lasso tool, except that it sticks to the edges of the objects. Magic Cut, found under the selection menu, provides an easy way to make a selection and cut it away from the background. In this two-step process, you first make an outline around the object using the brush and eraser tools. In the second step, you get a screen with your object isolated from the background. Now you can use the brush and eraser tools to clean up the cutout. Of all the activities in the digital darkroom, cropping is one of the most essential. Cropping allows us to take average images and reorganize them into works of art. In Photo Studio, cropping is accomplished by using any of the selection tools. Here we use the rectangle selection tool to define the boundaries of the new image. Then the crop tool is used to discard the unselected portion. For best results, any cropping should be completed before tonal correction tools are used. Now, let's put together everything we've learned and see how you might go about improving an image. Here's a cute dog opening a present. The first thing we'll do is crop the image to an engaging portrait using the rectangle selection tool and the crop tool. Now, let's look at the tonal qualities. The dog is underexposed, partially because of the backlighting from the window and partially because he's a black dog. We select the dog using the magnetic lasso tool. We'll fix the underexposure with the Brightness Contrast command under the Enhance menu. First, we boost the brightness and then follow along with an increase in contrast. Now, let's look at color. The highlights in the dog's fur are very blue, reflecting the light from the outdoors. We can warm the color up using the Color Balance command under the Enhance menu. We choose highlights, then we move the cyan red slider to the right to about 15. We move the blue-yellow slider to the left to about 15. We deselect the dog using Control N and the portrait is complete. One final word about printing or sending photos. Pay attention to the resolution size of a photo or pixels per inch. 72 pixels per inch is the accepted resolution for computer screens and that includes the internet. If you want to print the same photograph on an inkjet printer, especially if you want top quality appearance on glossy paper, you will need significantly better resolution, say 200 to 300 dots per inch. Well, that's it. We hope this introduction to using the Digital Rebel XT will help you take the best pictures possible. Some of the topics in this presentation may not seem important to you yet, but use the camera for a while. As you become more comfortable with the Digital Rebel XT, you'll find yourself taking better pictures than you ever imagined.
You'll also see situations that are addressed in the advanced topics of this video. Refer to this presentation anytime you want. Well, thanks for watching. Now go out and take some great photos.